We are ready to call to order uh, the Mass Gaming Commission public meeting number 197. Um, we are at 10 o'clock on August 10th at the Mass Gaming Commission offices. The first item on the agenda, as usual, is the approval of minutes. Uh, Commissioner McDonald. Yes, I move uh, that we approve the, the minutes of July 21st, uh, 2016, subject to corrections, uh, typographical <coughs> errors, and other non-material matters. Second? I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Okay, we are at item number three, the racing division. Um, Director Lightbound, our first item is the Brockton Fairgrounds request. Good morning. <coughs> Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have uh, with us the President Bill Aguario. Hit the button. Today we have with us uh, Bill Agorio, the president of the Mass Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association, um, Robert Scarano, the legal counsel, Mike Merzio, legal counsel for um, Middleborough Agriculture, and um, Chris Carney is also here if you have questions for him. So what we'll do first is have um, Mike Merzio start with a brief description of the legal arguments that he um, presented in the packet. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to mention quickly that Mr. Carney couldn't be here today. He had a family medical issue last night that kept him in the hospital all evening. It's not uh, because of himself, but uh, so he was up all evening and he couldn't be here today. Uh, I think the uh, the flow chart that we provided uh, as an attachment to our writing is probably the, the most helpful piece of information we could have submitted to explain the uh, waterfall concept that's in section 60 the Gaming Act. Uh, I think the uh, Section 60 provision clearly says that the racehorse development funds may be used to fund purses uh, <coughs> consistent with the purse agreements between the track and the Horsemen's Association. And as our waterfall uh, diagram shows, that's exactly what we're asking to do. We're not asking that the, that the uh, commissioners divert or redire redirect any of the racehorse development funds, but they simply be uh, allocated to the purse agreements uh, consistent to the purse account consistent with our purse agreement with Mass THA. Uh, as to the broader question of the Commission's discretion, uh, I think we addressed that also in our writing. Uh, sections uh, 4 and 1 of the Gaming Act uh, give the Commission extremely broad power. In fact, uh, section 1, <coughs> Section 10, specifically says that the powers of the Commission are to be construed as broadly as necessary uh, to accomplish the purposes of the statute. Supporting horse racing is one of those purposes, and we're simply asking that uh, the uh, <coughs> language of Section 60 be followed specifically. We're not asking for any unique uh, deviations or interpretations but just follow the plain language and, and fund the purses for the fair uh, meets uh, uh, consistent with our purse agreement. So that's, uh, I'd be happy to answer any specific questions, but it really is a rather straightforward uh, uh, analysis. Mr. Maurizio, um, although you say it's just going to purse agreement, you also repeatedly have broken down um, all of the track private business expenses here and and are asking us to pay for all of those uh, items. You have them all itemized out, which which uh, I give you credit for doing, but on one hand you're saying it's just the purse account, that's all we're asking for, but then you lay it all out, um, you know, uh, uh, things that, uh, uh, that the track any private business would cover and not from a fund like this. That's where I'm <coughs> continue to um, struggle with your argument. Um, all of these, all of these um, issues, all of these private business itemized uh, um, expenses are, are laid out here. So that, that's where it's hard to just say, hey, this is just for purses. Hey, I understand the question. Uh and your concern, Commissioner. What we've done is attempted to, to be an open book, a full disclosure mm -hmm. of exactly how this racing meet would be put together. Uh, 
so, you know, we, we don't have any secrets. We're not trying to, to keep any secrets. But those are the expenses, they, so the itemized expenses that the horsemen will pay, mm -hmm. not the commission, not the <coughs> racehorse development fund. And I think if we look at the statute, we recognize that uh, the color of money goes from public funds to private funds once it's dedicated to the purse account. That's what the statute provides. That's been racing history in the Commonwealth and across the, uh, the country, frankly. I, I'm not familiar with any other race meet in which the horsemen pick up all the expenses for the private racetrack. Well, <coughs> I, think it's a I think that's, uh, we have to remember that this is restarting an industry here uh, that uh, is pretty well contracted to almost nothing in the Commonwealth. And so when you start <coughs> talking about starting up a new industry, starting up a new business, the two key players often have unique relationships that perhaps won't continue in the second or the third or the fifth year. This is a, a private, I don't want to say private transaction, but the track is saying to the horsemen, uh, it is uneconomical for the track by itself to take a million five out of its own pocket and conduct a 15-day racing meet and 112 days of racing and training for the small handle that's going to be generated in the first year. <coughs> it just doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've turned to the horsemen and said, uh, if you contribute to these expenses, then together we can recreate this industry uh, here in the Commonwealth. Could I, could I just interrupt? I want to just make one, I think it's an important uh, clarifying point. We've been look, looking at this in a two-step process. First of all, do we have the authority to use racehorse development fund monies for administrative and horse racing operations, for administrative expenses and horse racing operations? Um, what, and the second question is, if we do, is this an appropriate use of that money? And it seems to me that, that you're raising a question about not whether or not we have the authority, but whether this is an appropriate use of that authority. Am, am I right? Uh, yes. I know that we have, in the past, uh, the precedent is that, that we have used a small amount of racehorse development fund for the Horsemen's Association administrative um, expenses. <coughs> we have done that okay. at Suffolk. We have not uh, in, at any time uh, used right. those funds for the track uh, the, the expenses that the track will incur. So I was just Understood. trying to separate Well, I, I get that. And that's a very important point, and I'm with you on those questions. Is this an appropriate use? But you, so your view is and uh, that, that, yes, we do have the authority to use Racehorse Development Fund um, for some ad administrative and horse racing operation expenses. We've done it in the past. Well, I think I, <coughs> my view is that I separate the two. One is the Horsemen's Association and their expenses, um, yeah, okay. which I believe we have done and is, is an appropriate use, but the private business's expenses um, is another okay. question. Right. And I, I understand that. Okay, so that's, I, I get that. But I just, I want to I see if we are all in agreement that, um, we, that this is a conversation that we can have. It is an appropriate conversation for us to decide is this a legitimate use of our discretion? Commissioner Cameron is suggesting maybe this is not. Maybe this is beyond her belief of what administrative and operational, uh, horse racing and operation expenses should be. But we're not debating anymore the question of whether or not we do have the authority to make expenditures for what we will eventually define as administrative and horse racing operation expenses. Well, I think, I think the definition is what matters. I think what, what, what we're talking about, I, I, I'm still, I would like to get to what, what you describe as the first question um, as, as to the legal authority, uh, if, I, if I may. Um, I, I, I think by, by the argument that you make, Mr. Maurizio, any, any expenditure would qualify. That's right. You, I mean, could, you could qualify capital costs, maybe? Well. Um, any, any other private business? If, if as long as you put it in a fund, the color of m money, the waterfall effect, not just administrative expenses. Am I correct on that? That's correct. Keep in mind also that the purse money is paid to a horseman as winnings. 
when that money comes to the horseman, he, that horseman is going to use those funds for any number of expenses. Some of it is going to go to the track, but where's the rest of it going? If the commission had to be concerned with what the horsemen are spending their winnings on, then the commission should ha would have to be concerned about accounting for 100% of those funds. So a horseman's going to get a, a purse of payment. Some of it's going to go to the track. Where's the rest of it going? Pay his mortgage, <coughs> college expense for his children, maybe some for horse racing expenses in the future. It's for any number of items. And what we're simply saying is that the fact that the horseman is paying the track some amount of money is no different than the horseman using his winnings for all his other or her other personal expenses. That's the line, and that's what we yeah, tried to show in our diagram, that once it's paid as winnings, that's the end of the, uh, uh, you know, the jurisdiction or the discretion or, of the commission. Now, it does, it does um, chapter uh, 23K does, section 60 does say that the account shall be for the benefit of horsemen. You're saying you could do anything with it in answer to Commissioner Zuniga's question. That would not square with that. It, it could be, uh, the statute says for the benefit of horsemen, so they couldn't give it to Joe Smith to start a movie theater. It's going from the commission, if you will, to the horsemen, and then the horsemen are deciding what to use the money for as they decide what is in their own benefit. Right, but it's, it is limited by for the benefit of horsemen. They of can't course. use it for something else that doesn't have anything to do with the horsemen. They couldn't decide to, you know, invest it in, in uh, drone development or something. Well, I think the horsemen could. It goes into the purses for the benefit of the horsemen, meaning the purse payment, the winnings. It's, it's not for the benefit of the horsemen by itself. It's paid into purses, purses of winnings, for the benefit of the <coughs> horsemen, for their benefit of receiving the purse payment. What the horsemen do with their funds afterwards is their own decision to be consistent. And if the commission believes it has to analyze and approve what the horsemen are doing with their purse winnings, then you'd have to look at everything they spend their horse winnings, purse winnings on which obviously doesn't make sense. You wouldn't do that. Mr. Lagor, you, had, you wanted to say something? I, I want to take, uh, just take a little bit of the legal side out of it right now because it's, you know, to me it gets as tangled as it, as it gets. I, I, I think we've been given guidelines. And to Mr. Maurizio's point, yeah, it's, you know, transaction. But we know, certainly know, that, that these expenses have got to be li related to racetrack operations. We understand that uh, we have to show you what we're doing with the money and account for it. We're not asking for... Uh, uh, just a broad painting of this is to take the money and do what you want with absolutely has to go for. Uh, we, we received initially restrictions on, on not using it for capital expenses, that it has to be operational and administrative. And, you know, that, that a large amount of it, in this particular case, you know, a, a large amount of that budget would go towards paying um, operations of the racetrack, including officials, a lot of people that were displaced uh, after 2014 at Suffolk Downs, and, and a lot of the jobs uh, will be provided from some of that administrative monies as well. Um, to Commissioner Cameron's point, I, I agree. Um, <coughs> in the past, you didn't see monies covered for by a racetrack. It's not the normal. But we have seen um, the past two years operating the three days and, and this year six days in their agreement, an agreement which provides, which is conventionally our press money to be used for expenses. And in the case of this year, the six days, it's a, pre it's a pretty good number. Uh, you know, I believe it's 950,000 to operate six days and a few days of training. So I think that um, that door has been open to some degree. Uh, we're, we're just looking to uh, get something started. We're looking to uh, bring racing back at Brockton and help the local people. And we're looking at, you know, utilizing money. It is different. And, and you know, this isn't normal. You know, the, the normally you, you, the, the, all the <coughs> expenses are paid for by the racetrack. And I understand that fully. And uh, we want to account for everything we're doing. We do believe that um, the husbands certainly are for utilizing some of the race house development fund money to pay expenses because this is what we need to do. It's the husband that need it. It's not the county family. It's not Brockton. We're, we need a place. We're looking for a host track, and we're the ones who are in great need. 
uh, trying to make this work and um, you know taking a lot of the legal jargon out of it it translates to we do need this administrative money it is uh, a rehabilitation project there and uh, it's the beginning so um, I just want to kind of reduce it down a little bit so we'll, but I just I do want to we, we have had um, a number of submissions to us that's that urge us uh, to, per, to take the position that we do not have the authority to do this period it's not a matter of debating whether it's the right kind of an expense or can it be used for the track or can it replace track ex it is whether we have the authority to use this money for this purpose at all and for the purpose of getting our records straight I want to just stick with this for a minute and then move on to the to the question that we all I think is really important which is this a, is this an appropriate use of some discretion that we do have. Um, <clears throat> I just want to get uh, com um, General Counsel Blue's um, sense on the issue of whether or not we do indeed have the discretion. Then I want to give a couple thoughts of my own, and then maybe we can move on to the issue that you're raising. Um, good morning, Commissioners. I, I want, um, before we address that, I just want to point out one thing that the Commission may want to think about, and that is, you know, we, we are looking at statutes here, so we are you know, bound by the law. There is a distinction under the statute between the, a horseman and a horseman's organization. And I think there is an important distinction there between, because a horseman is someone who gets a purse. The horseman's organization is someone we're talking about whether they should get funded to help the track. So there, under our statutory, under our set of statutes, there is a distinction between the two. And I know we all use the word interchangeably, but sometimes we just need to keep that in mind. Um, we, we discussed our statutory authority a little bit at the last meeting. I think what we all understand is we're looking at two different statutes here. We're looking at 128 A and C, which is the racing statute, which the commission has the authority to implement and the discretion to interpret as it needs to. We're also looking at 23 K section 60, which is the resource development fund under the gaming act. I think that what we see from those two statutes is that there is a difference in terms of how they treat purse money. Whether that difference is intentional on the part of the legislature is, is very hard to discern. There's not legislative history on this. Under normal statutory construction canons, there is an argument that a more specific amendment would trump a more general statute. But there is ambiguity between the two. So the commission could look at this and could determine that it is ambiguous, that it wishes to determine but whether it has discretion, and it could determine that it has some discretion to do something under, under Section 60, that if the legislature had thought about it, if they had been asked directly, maybe they would have thought, yes, I should have <coughs> amended Section 60 to comply with 128 A and C. So that's, the Commission has discretion to look at the two together and determine whether, if the legislature had been asked, they would have gone that way. I, I think that's, that's key, what you just said. The, um, the specificity of 2015 is what I was arguing last time uh, that constrains our ability to have to exercise a lot of discretion relative to administrative costs in this case because 2015 was very specific which was extended in the use of for administrative costs out of the takeouts uh, or premiums that came from the simulcasting uh, activity not from the racehorse development fund and that's the piece that I'm still struggling with uh, in the request that we have in front of us, in front of us, um, for for the purposes of all all of track operations. So let me, let me just see if I can <coughs> put a, a, a an end point on this because we can we've got a lot of these things we have to resolve. There is it is clear that the amendment in 2015 focuses on the takeouts of certain other sources of monies Simulcast. or simulcast and others. Mm -hmm. um, but it, when combined, as, as General Counsel Blue was saying, as combined with 23K, with Section 60C, 60, um, 6, Section 60, it's clear from our own actions that we see this as ambiguous. The Suffolk Downs and the New England Horseman Benefit, BP, NEHBPA, wrote us on the June 6th and requested that we use racehorse development funds for administrative and horse racing operation expenses. Suffolk Downs and New England Horsemen's Association believe that that money can be used from the Racehorse Development Fund for administrative and horse racing operations. 
We? No, no, I, I don't know that. Mm. I don't think well, we, what is that? What we, exactly is that, uh, that? We did give to the NEHPPA $225,000. The, uh, the association. The association. Not the horsemen. Not the purses. Well, it came from Racehorse Development Fund yes, money. Yes, but so not, not for purses. Not, not for, uh, not for track operations. For track operations, I mean. No, I not for track operations. It was <laughs> for the, the operating and administrative expenses of the NEHPPA. Right. They also asked us for a number of other costs, which we denied. But, uh, right. but that's Sorry. my point. That's yep. my point. We can use it for some kinds of administrative and operational expenses. Which kinds we use it for, we can debate. But it's not debatable that we can use it for some administrative and horse racing operations. Uh, if, if we're OK on that, then we can get to, OK, we do have the ability to use it for some administrative and horse racing operations in some fashion. Now, but what use is the one that we get to next? But for the record, I want us to have been clear that we have thought through and have made an informed decision about a statute which is unclear, and we are interpreting to say, yes, we do have the authority to let to uh, assign or let racehorse development funds be used for some administrative and horse racing operations. See, you know, I would disagree that <coughs> we have the authority to use it for all, and I think our recommendation by our general counsel and our director of racing is that for the Horsemen's Association, we have some discretion not for track operations. That's their recommendation to us. So yeah. I, I, I don't know that I would be uh, willing to, to say or to, to stipulate that, yes, I agree that we can use it for any and all expenses. I didn't yeah. say that. Yeah, well, you I, said any operations no, we, at the track. You, you no. Didn't. Well, the words are in the law, horse, and in our, in our own letter, in our own recommendation. The words, in quotes, are horse administrative and horse racing operations. That's what the money was requested for by, by Suffolk Downs and NEPHPA. Those are the words that are also used in the 2015 amendment. But it not I, just I'm, any I'm administrative. Not, no, no, I'm not, I don't have the word any. any we're going to debate okay. what does it, administrative and horse racing operations mean. That's what we're going to try to figure out. Does it include money to go for the track? Maybe, maybe not. Your view at this point is not. Fine. Um, can it be a lot rather than a little? That's worth debating. But we do have the authority to, d to define what administrate, quote, administrative and horse racing operations means in this context. That's, that is what we are defining. Is it, does it give us the ability to do any administrative and horse racing operation? That's debatable. That's what we will determine. But that we do have the right to determine that is the, is the point that I want to have on, on the record and that we've agreed on that. <coughs> Are you, are you well, I, I, I guess I, I see your point. I, I don't want to be uh, sort of close to, to uh, obtuse to this, but uh, I, I, I think it matters very much, you know, I, what, what we're talking about in terms of the purpose. I know you're trying to make it a, a, a two-part question, but I see it more interrelated as in depends what we're talking about. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, I get it. <laughs> Let's... Um, I think we are saying different things in apparently somewhat different ways. I mean, the very fact that we are here debating which expenses we might authorize does suggest that we think we have the ability to determine which expenses we might authorize. So let's move on. Um, and now let's talk about they have suggested that we use our discretion to fund $1.5 million of expenses as enumerated on that chart. Is that something that we want to do? Is that an appropriate use of our discretion? You, is Can there, I yeah. Yeah, we, 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 we take, a, take a step back? Um, no. Sorry. <laughs> Can I take a step back? <laughs> that, um, and I'm, I'm looking to, to General Counsel Blue to help on this. As I understood um, you know, her presentation at the uh, prior meetings and also confirmed in in uh, uh, conversations uh, with her, that um, uh, that notwithstanding uh, the fact that that um, 23K section um, 60C1 um, is appears to be explicit that the resource development f funds are, are used for purposes of of um, being combined with revenues from existing purse agreements 
to fund purses for live races, which <clears throat> uh, by its uh, plain terms um, would appear to suggest that the, that the resource development funds um, um, uh, uh, application are limited to funding purpose purses for live races. But notwithstanding that, that, that kind of custom and practice in the past uh, has been that um, uh, these funds from purse agreements, small amounts of, relatively small amounts of funds from uh, purse agreements have been <coughs> applied uh, to, uh, in fact, fund administrative um, and uh, operational expenses uh, at the tracks. That the thrust of her advice is that it's not that this has not happened in the past, but that it's been the exception, and so that that the that the uh, situation that we're dealing with here is a fundamental uh, change of the scale of the amount of the funds that are being sought to be explicitly directed to uh, to um, administrative and horse racing uh, operations, and that's on the basis of that. <coughs> You know, disjunction uh, between the scale of what's being proposed here and what has been traditionally or that that in the past uh, has uh, has occurred that uh, uh, under um, that is the basis uh, of uh, uh, our general counsel's uh, advice to us uh, to reject this this um, uh, request is that f a fair statement General Counsel Blue? I, I think it is. I think the amendments in 2015 to 128 A and C most likely codified a practice that had existed for a long time. And so it removed the, the question of scale from 128 A and C. Um, it did not address Section 60, which is the unfortunate part. If the legislature had addressed them both equally and had treat, you know, had treated them the same, we probably wouldn't be having this discussion. So, so I think the scale question was addressed under the, under the horse racing statute because back in the older t period, that was the only place purse money came from unless the track put it in themselves. So I, I think, yes, generally what you've, what you've stated is correct and we're between two statutes. Right, and just so that the, that the, those are here from the public and those observing us, that, that the 2015 legislation was limited to uh, proceeds that were received pursuant to the simulcast revenues, correct? Simulcast, live handle, and premiums. Okay. Three different sources of, of money. But, all but, from, but, but all did not the apply, racing but did not apply, did not reference the Racehorse Development Fund. No. That's sorry. correct. I guess I'm, <coughs> excuse me, maybe I'm mistaken. I thought that the only, di the only um, monies that we have approved traditionally were to uh, administration for the Horsemen's Associations. You are, you are correct. That's so the that only is money very that different than approved. the scale for all of racetrack operations. Yes, that's correct. So which of us is? Well, th Commissioner McDonald's talking about the statute, and, and he's correct when you talk about the statutes. When you talk about what the commission has done in the past, yes, you have only approved operations and administrative expenses for the horsemen's organization. But it is our understanding that they have a purse agreement with Suffolk mm -hmm. and they may have made arrangements with other pots of money under 128 A and C mm -hmm. to do other things with. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're not a party to that. But, but specifically you, including administrative and operational expenses to some extent. That, that's, and that would be appropriate scale. under 128 A and C but for those mm -hmm. months. But that's all coming from the activity that takes place there, not coming from tax money, which is the Racehorse Development Fund. I think, you know, it, if, we're, if, we're stepping, if we're taking a step back, I, I might argue that the whole reason of funding purses um, is to increase the activity that might take place there by attracting betters and, you know, and, and, and horsemen from uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to be to have uh, the activity take take place, therefore resulting in benefit to mm -hmm. a lot of people, uh, including the state in this case. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. That that helps clarify. I, I see your point, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, and as I said last week, I I know. As I said last week, I don't think there is just one plain reading of the language. I disagree with 
Commissioner McDonald, but I think we've gotten to the same place here. Um, so, which is uh, that we can mm -hmm. debate whether or not the 1.5 mm -hmm. is, is an mm -hmm. appropriate uh, utilization of resource development fund monies. So, um, do you have any more to say about that issue? Um, you know, okay, we've, we've, we will now discuss whether or not this is an appropriate use of the money. Um, why do you think it is? you have anything else to say to us about why you think it is? I do. Um, Robert Scarano. First of all, the regulatory authority that you possess is broad in scope. In the preamble to 194 Section 16, we had previously talked about Section 10. We also have Section 12, um, which requires uh, the Commission seek the highest and best return to the Commonwealth and to the region. Mm -hmm. That is a broad power that's designed to give economic impact to a region and to address the intent of the statute, which is to get money to the horsemen and horsemen's organizations mm -hmm. so that it can be utilized to operate the facility necessary in order to meet this intent and this legislative intent. I think that we're chasing uh, backwards because without a meet, without a meet being operated, there can be no satisfaction of the intent or the commission's powers. Mr. Scarano, what you, re you reference which statute, 194? That was 194 section 16. And, which, and which I was talking one? about uh, the preamble uh, for the commission's powers. Oh, okay. 2011, the, the acts of 2011. Is, it's the acts of 2011. Okay. Um, I would just say the commission's legal department respectfully disagrees that that section applies to racing. Yeah. It is a gaming <coughs> section. Right. And I think overall, the gaming uh, section itself uh, actually is, is incorporated in the powers that are suggested by the legislature to this commission. And when it grants those powers, uh, those pro powers are fairly broad and can be utilized <coughs> to effectuate the purpose uh, of the entire scheme, not pieces of the scheme. And I would just go to uh, Mr. Crosby's um, and, and Mr. McDonald's bifurcation if you're looking at a bifurcation of what the uh, budget suggests, maybe there is a carve-out provision for things that you find objectionable as a track capital expenditure. But I don't think that prevents the board and the commission from granting the money for the specific purpose of operating a meet. Um, if there were objectionable expenses that sh shouldn't be or couldn't be utilized from the Resource <coughs> Development Fund, then a bifurcation is obviously necessary. But I don't think the entire budget is objectionable to that effect. So mm -hmm. if there is a specific carve-out and the Commission feels that there are certain mm -hmm. uh, line items in here that are simply uh, objectionable and can't be uh, facilitated through the Resource Development Fund, then we should carve those out. But we shouldn't kill the application because um, we're trying to operate a meet. Uh, we have horsemen um, that are looking for a meet. You have racehorse development funds that are necessary to be moved um, by the intent of the statute to the horsemen. Uh, and the horsemen's organization is facilitating that. Mm -hmm. So again, I would, I would mm -hmm. respectfully request that if there's a bifurcation necessary, then a line <laughs> item strike would be, uh, would be appropriate, mm -hmm. but that the entire budget itself shouldn't be objectionable. Mm -hmm. Before we get to that point, you know, this application started off, you know, we, we've been referencing the exit 2015, the use of simulcast money and, and premiums and takeouts for operational administrative expenses. When this application first came to us, simulcasting was going to be part of the racing package and has since been stripped out. If the simulcasting piece had stayed in, would most of the administrative costs of this meet have been met? If I can address that, uh, Commissioner, uh, simulcasting at a fair does not contribute to the purse account. Be the reason is that uh, under 128C, the way it's structured today, the host track gets the simulcast premiums, and the host track is Suffolk Downs. So if the fair were to invest in the structure of a, a simulcasting function, which we don't have the budget for, the 
the simulcast premiums are then paid to the host tracker, not to us. Uh, not to. Uh, I, I see some shaking right. heads, yeah. but I'd love to see what. I, I do I'd love too. To think I, I don't think thinking. that's accurate in this case. Obviously, right? Right. right. Yeah. I, I think you'd have to examine it a little closer because uh, the premium structure is paid to to the racing meeting licensee in 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 uh, Suffolk County. Uh, that's where the the premium payments go. The fair section is entirely different. It's a, uh, under 128C. It's a separate if section. I, if I could jump in and just add to that, I, it, it, Mr. Tuttle's position is correct that if we were the host racetrack. We wouldn't be paying the premiums. We'd be sending, you know, our signal going out would not be based on premiums. I think the, the jurisdiction would be that if, if we're simulcasting other venues, like taking the New York signal, et cetera, et cetera, then we'd be obliged to pay the 3% premium to the host track. But the signal going out would not be an issue as far as paying a premium. That would be the case. The host race track um, would then send the signal out and not pay a premium. Uh, the other track providing the racing would send the signal out and not pay anything to the uh, what's considered the host track in the Commonwealth because, of course, we would be the host race track. Right. I think, I think the issue is the revenue we would generate would be very minimal to offset expenses. Um, we have talked on and off about doing it. Uh, I, I, I think one of the reasons that it got delayed in, in translation was the federal lawsuit that was filed left us with some questions as to what we should do with simulcasting. I, I, I think that... Uh, we could simulcast. I do, to to uh, Commissioner Stebbins' point, I think the um, offsetting expenses would be minimal. It could be done, and we could certainly, based on revenues, use that against um, what we've requested. Uh, I, I don't think there'd be anywhere near the monies based on what we would generate at the fair, um, what you'd normally generate at, a, at a, uh, a larger facility to offset expenses for simulcasting. But uh, to clear that up, uh, you know, and, and to, uh, uh, Chip Tuttle's correct in saying that, that, you know, that we would be the host racetrack in this case. I, I think just for point of clarification, I see where the confusion is. When, if we were to simulcast in Brockton, the person who is the patron that's at Brockton is not going to bet through the simulcast system on the live racing that's there at the track. The person, the patron that's at the track, if they're betting simulcasting between races, they're betting on racing that's con being conducted at a different track. The premium for that activity would be paid to Suffolk But just 3%? Uh, I, I don't recall what that's the percentage is. That's what it is. is. And, and that, in, I mean, what we've all learned an awful lot about racing. That's what brings people to watch live racing is they also get to watch other races and simulcast. I mean, that's a huge revenue generator. And that, that actually was one of my main questions. Why, um, why are you cutting out something that could generate revenue? Instead, you're just asking for the Racehorse Development Fund to pay everything when that's a huge money generator. But the cost to establish the simulcast, we would have done that if we thought the net would be a, that the net would be a positive, a, a positive financial. Uh, contribution. It has nothing to do with Raynham down no, the road. No, we did this all by itself because the patrons that would be at, at, uh, at uh, the Brockton facility would be the ones that are engaging in simulcasting. And when you look, it's, it, Raynham has got nothing to do with it. You have live customers at Brockton. No, we, we, we see it at Plain Ridge. We see what a, a generator it is of revenue, the simulcast portion. I, I just, I'm at a loss to understand why you won't simulcast and bring in other folks that would, that, that enjoy both. They watch live races and, they, and then they bet on other tracks at the same time. Well, the, the judgment, that all I can tell you is what the judgment was made, that the capital investment to create the simulcast operation in this first year was uh, more prohibitive or would not be offset by the revenue that it would generate. What's the capital investment? Uh, televisions, the security. Those are there. They're at the track. They've no, been there. I've I, seen them. That's, I'm, that's not my uh, bailiwick to go through it, but that's, that's the analysis that was done. <laughs> if I may. Well, if um, I could just, just make, a, make a point that this is somewhat off topic, but nevertheless it, 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 it does affect uh, uh, my personal view of, of, uh, of, 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 of matters here. This reference to uh, simulcasting and the payment of the 3% uh, premium 
the, uh, the Commission has been informed um, that um, uh, uh, Mr. Carney or Carney, Mr. Carney's organization at, at Raynham uh, has withheld over $300,000 that were due uh, Suffolk, uh, Suffolk Downs uh, from uh, the simulcasting revenues uh, received at, um, uh, at Raynham. And that uh, now uh, uh, Mr. Carney, through, the, through <coughs> uh, his, his Brockton property, is asking uh, you know, the commission to approve uh, almost a million and a half dollars uh, in uh, operational and administrative expenses. It doesn't sit well, at least with this commissioner, that um, uh, uh, the Carney interests are, are withholding funds that ought to be going for the horsemen through uh, Suffolk Downs while asking for the order of magnitude of assistance from the Racehorse Development Fund. Uh, with regard to Brockton. <clears throat> um, if I might respond, of course, that matter is subject to uh, a federal lawsuit filed by the NEHBPA. Uh, I would, uh, I do respect uh, the uh, issue being brought up, uh, but to be discussed here, uh, when the commission actually has a right to intervene in that lawsuit, may not be as appropriate, uh, but I don't believe that the reason for s not simulcasting at uh, <coughs> Brockton is related to any issue between the Connies and Suffolk Downs. Uh, and I certainly can understand um, <coughs> Judge's reservation uh, relevant to asking for funds while that money is outstanding, but that is a separate matter that is going to be taken up between the any HBPA <coughs> and the Connies. As it relates to the Brockton application. Well, let me just stop you there. But we have been advised by our general counsel that, that um, the Raynham position uh, is, is not supported in the law. And, so and it's I not have a question no of in intervening. I mean, we're being asked to, to, you know, to, to, to exercise our authority <laughs> under, the, under, the, um, uh, under the statutes. And um, we're faced with a situation where, where um, the Raynham track um, the, the Carney interests have failed, according to uh, our general counsel, to uh, comply with their obligations to uh, pay these funds uh, to Suffolk Downs for the benefit of the horsemen at Suffolk Downs. I, I fully understand what the position is and, and whether the obligation <coughs> is valid. Um, I'm not here to comment on it. Um, but if you're connecting the Brockton application to the uh, actual payment of that money, um, I, I would suggest that uh, this application didn't go forward um, with, that, uh, with that position. Uh, and we fully expect the counties to, to do what it is uh, necessary in order to address their obligations. But going back to this application uh, and um, the issues that we had previously discussed with the budget, uh, I think we were discussing uh, whether or not a bifurcation or a, or a line item uh, issue exists with uh, respect to the Commission's discretion to grant that money. Um, <coughs> notwithstanding that there is money owed between the Carnies and uh, the NEHBPA who opposes this, um, but I think that complicates the matter when we're here looking at exercising the broader discretion of the Commission uh, in its exercise of determining what monies could be available for operational expenses uh, at the Brockton Fairgrounds. Um, and if we were to get back to that um, issue, um, if there are objectionable items in the budget that the commission felt were um, uh, capital expenditures <coughs> or to well, be... Let me, let me get to that. Yeah. Um, we, we will be addressing the $300,000 issue that Commissioner McDonald uh, has raised um, in due time. Um, he said it wasn't directly related, but it does create a sort of a, a sniff test problem that does affect, he said, at least that commissioner, and I get that point, and um, and we will be we will be addressing that issue. Um, I would like to do what you're asking. My when when Suffolk Downs applied for uh, some racehorse development fund monies uh, to go to other things than purses, there were two buckets that they requested. One was for uh, administrative expenses of the NEHBPA, and if I'm correct. 
uh, another hundred thousand dollars to do I think it was a feasibility study of mm -hmm. the equine center we went through that proposal and we decided that the 225 for administrative expenses for the NHPPA was an appropriate discretionary use of racehorse development funds but that the hundred thousand dollars for the equine feasibility study was not so we, we refused that 100000 did the 225 We didn't say 325 was too much. We said <clears throat> the 100000 was not an appropriate use. It doesn't fall within what we define as administrative <clears throat> and racehorse operations. The same thing applies here. I, I'm, this is really complicated in the sense that there's no clear right or wrong. You can see how we're trying to wrestle with this. But in the final analysis, it, there, boils down to me that we have a bunch of people of good faith, passionate about this industry, who thinks this would be a misuse of the Racehorse Development Fund, and a bunch of people of good faith who are passionate about the industry who believe this would be a good use of the Racehorse Development Fund. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody makes the case that any of the uses that we've dealt with this year is a long-term strategy. Nobody's given us a long-term strategy. Everybody's fighting to survive while we try to figure out can we get a long-term strategy. So far the legislature's not been willing to give us or frankly we've said to the legislature we don't care if you want to give the authority to fix horse racing to somebody else. We're not debating it. We don't want it. If somebody else wants it, take it. But we're willing to do it if somebody wants us to give it the, the authority. Nobody's done that yet. So we're dealing with a bunch of imperfect band-aids which are short-term solutions. I'm ultimately very much leaning towards wanting to use a big chunk of this for to give some sustenance to some folks that will at least get some marginal benefit this year. Maybe it will be enough of a generator that something else can come from it. Um, but I want to go through the particulars here because even in what I am beginning to think is an appropriate definition of admin or uh, discretionary definition of administrative and racehorse operations, um, they would not qualify. There's at least a couple. The, uh, the repair rail racetrack service refurbished starting gate, $150,000. Under the circumstances, that to me is clearly a capital expense. I mean, you've got a facility which is basically needs to get rebuilt. That's not just everyday uh, maintenance, everyday operations. That feels to me like even in my evolving definition would be outside the parameters. Mr. The Mr. Chair, I have a, just a, a point before we start bifurcating some of these expenses or thinking about them. Um, some of these expenses we know will have to be paid up front before the purse money would be able to somehow subsidize some of these costs. So who's <clears throat> up fronting the money for the capital improvements? Where's that money coming from? Knowing the purse money has got to go out, it's got to be then paid to the horsemen after the race, <coughs> some of these expenses are up front. But presumably the Kearney organization. As long as they knew that they were going to be repaid, I mean, you can, yeah. they could, they could they, probably the bank finance. I mean, is, 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 is that the case? Well, yes, the, uh, the uh, Middleborough will be paying for these expenses before it would be reimbursed by the horsemen for those expenses. Um, and in some of these line items, such as repairing the rail and racetrack surface, they're not all capital expenses. There's labor involved in this. Uh, uh, well, labor will right. be part of the capital expense. Let, oh, me, let me just finish running through my, my <coughs> thoughts about this list. Um, the 150 seems to me to be an issue. The $64,000 in real estate taxes seems to me to, that's something that's going to have to get paid whether you race or not. If I'm wrong about that, if that's an incremental expense, that's one thing. But if it's just your everyday run-of-the-mill real estate taxes that you're going to be paying, whether there's a race or not, that would not seem to me to qualify. Um, the 400000 in training and stalling, that's a really important piece of this because it's going to give people the time and the places to, to do the training. Um, if we go further, it, actually what I'm what I'm thinking is there are two, the 64,000 and the 150 that doesn't seem to me to fit, uh, even in an, ex an expansive definition of uh, administrative and racehorse operations. There are, there are two other parameters that I would want to put on this if we were going to go forward. One is that our 
staff be authorized to audit and monitor the utilizations to make sure that the utilizations do indeed comply with what we end up deciding. Um, and, uh, and secondly, that there are a bunch of issues that have been raised about the safety of the track. Uh, I'm not competent to make that decision in a, te in a technical way. None of us is. Uh, but I did talk with Director Lightbound, uh, and she said that it is anticipated that there would be external approvals and accreditation mm -hmm. uh, from Mick Peterson or whoever it is, uh, and I would put a condition on the expenditures in, of the monies that it only be done, the racing only take place if we have passed, if the facility has passed, whatever the professionals in the business, the best practice professionals in the business say, are the appropriate safety standards. So with an oversight and audit function and with a rigorous um, approval subs uh, pursuant to safety um, and with the exception of those two buckets, the 150 and the 64, um, I, I am leaning towards saying it is imperfect in the extreme. Um, but it's not utilizing the whole fund. The fund is going to be replenished every year. Um, there is a broad-based benefit of the horsemen. This clearly would be a benefit for a bunch of horsemen. Um, I'm leaning towards uh, wanting to do that. I had a slightly, well, probably a very different approach. I really struggle with um, track private costs coming out of the racehorse development fund. Um, I very much agreed with our decision to help the Horsemen's Association at Suffolk, and I'm very much uh, in favor of doing the same here if this project were to go forward. Um, your point is well taken, Mr. Chair, that uh, this would, these decisions would be much easier if we had a horsemen's group that uh, were in agreement, but they're not. And if, even if we're to... Um, even if we're to say that there's, say, 50% of the horsemen in each group, which we don't have a way of quantifying, but there, there's, a, there's a group strongly against using the funds in this way. So that does complicate things. Having said that, um, the one piece I look at in this, uh, in this um, list, itemized list, that really is related to the horsemen would be the training and stalling rent for 16 weeks. They do not have a place to train. So I would be in favor of adding the 400,000 to the um, 262, which they've already requested for the horsemen, uh, their um, association. This, the association. So when you look at that 400,000, the 262 plus the 2.4 for purses, uh, my number comes out to three, uh, three point one six, which I think is, is an is an awful lot of money for 15 days of fair racing. I would be willing to, to, uh, to go that far with this fund, but I am just not comfortable with uh, private monies that are usually paid for by the track. And it really is problematic to me that the one reason, the one generator in all of racing is simulcast and I, I, I'm really not understanding the argument that this track does not want to um, to add that value to their proposal. There are, there's not one thing here that as a track operator that the, uh, the owner is willing to fund and that's problematic to me and um, like I say uh, my number now is 3.16 adding that 400,000. I, I I think Mr. Legorio had something for example. Yeah, uh, Chris Connie is here today. And uh, to Commissioner Cameron's beliefs, I think uh, she's spot on that she's been most of the time we've been at meetings. Certainly the simulcasting will attract people, and I've talked about it. Um, it's late in the game, but Chris Connie's here today, and we had this discussion earlier. Chris is under the belief that we should simulcast, and I believe we should simulcast. The, the confusion, I think, came with the lawsuit and, and turned everything upside down. We had these discussions. I agree with Commissioner Cameron that, um, you know, by simulcasting, you do attract people. Uh, by simulcasting, you know, if I was going to go to Brockton for the day, for example, okay, and I could go there and, and throw a couple of dollars down at Saratoga, maybe it becomes more interesting to me and more appealing. I think Chris is very open to that today. And, and I think that we could use, of course, any revenues generated to offset some of the expenses. Um, I do know that the, the big problem is that you know, the county's lost quite a bit of money back in 2001 
um, and the husband really need this this venue to go. Um, I, I think in the long run, um, we do need additional monies. We do need the monies to operate the racing end of it. Um, but I think that simulcasting could be included and the stipulation that those revenues generated would offset um, directly those expenses, and we could do that. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, you're, you're correct in that assumption. I, I, and I think Chris, Chris is willing to do that, and I think uh, I would be more comfortable moving forward with simulcasting. You know, we're, we're representing a lot of husbands. There are those that don't agree with what we're doing. There's those that agree. We have a huge amount of people. The bottom line is we're trying to get people back to work. The spinoff has been the local farms. I don't know if you got to see the video we put together, and it's only seven and a half minutes. It was a 30, and Patty Ridden and I, by the way, Patty's having heart surgery today, minor, but that's why she's not here. Oh. Uh, she would love to be here today. But that's just, a, we, we went across the st state, and we went from Sunderland, Mass, to Hatfield, over to Norton, kind of all over. And, and the feeling's the same, that without some form of live racing, and to Commissioner Cameron's point again, that extended training and stabling is probably more key. Mm -hmm. Even more key than the racing. Without that, the farms are falling apart, and they can't exist anymore. There's no borders. Um, you know, the, the extended time at Brockton, when the meet is over, will allow us to stay there probably 30 days and beyond. And if we would like to, those people can jump over and run over at the Meadowlands or wherever. Important factor here is that when they return, they're buying their feed locally and they're supporting local vendors. So we can run out of town. We can use that facility, uh, which is what we need desperately. And we can start to get some of these farms uh, back on their feet. Um, but I do agree that simulcasting is a big part of it. I do. I, I just want to admit, you know, I, thank you, Bill. Um, you know, as, as I was looking through these expenses, and you've always clearly pointed out in the communications you've sent us uh, about the need for a place to train and how critical that, that is. And, and point being, you know, I uh, uh, agree with. Commissioner Cameron's point of that, you know, I could see that being a benefit of the membership that you offer to uh, horsemen who have their horses stabled here, you know, bred here, et cetera, uh, is a way to prepare them for racing, whether it's at Brockton or, as you pointed out, the ancillary opportunity to, to race at other locations. So, you know, of, of all of these expenses, the one that uh, I could see bifurcating out of this in putting it to the expenses of the Horsemen's Association would be the $400,000 in, in training and stalling costs uh, to allow your members the opportunity to train. Others? Well, I, um, I was originally on the notion that none of these track expenses would, um, would qualify under my my read of all the juxtaposition <coughs> of the authority and discretion. Mike. Yeah. Sorry. Um, originally under the assumption that none of these track expenditures um, would qualify under our authority to um, and discretion to fund um, to fund this. Um, I do take the stalling and um, training uh, rent uh, to be perhaps in the one category where we could um, uh, Put it back uh, to the uh, to the applicant to say you know uh, that that would be one one cost that we could fund. Uh, could you still? I, I still have the question as to whether they could run the meet um, because this seems to be you know really a, an exhaustive list of all track operations, um, and um, that's that's where I stand. So I, I'd be willing to go along for the sake of. Consensus in uh, a, you know allowing the four hundred thousand, but um, none of the other costs that are itemized here. That clearly, in my mind, are track operation costs. Do we have any idea or any ballpark, an intelligent ballpark estimate on what kind of revenues, if you did, if you do simulcast, which I hear you're saying you're prepared to do. Mr. Carney has said he would agree to do. Do you have any idea what kind of revenues might be generated? in it to the nearest, I don't know, 10,000, whatever, some uh, intelligent sense. Commission. About 50,000 a day on simulcasting. We average about 125,000 per land. So, so, 50, so
so 50, does 50,000 would mean revenue that could be put towards these expenses, give or take? 10% of it. Yeah, 15, yeah, 15 days. If you look back at 2001, it was 3% paid towards the purchase of some accounts that came out of bond there. I could have my account there, but it goes back a long time there. You know that one bit. It was written in the statute at the time. Uh, it then Governor, uh, the woman that lived in the Western Mass, she was the one that signed the bill. Swift. Before. That would be Jane Swift. Jane Swift. <laughs> I was her chief of staff, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not my lawsuit. I can't speak to my father, but if you look at his interpretation, is, and his interpretation sometimes is different than others, as I know him and love him work very well, uh, <laughs> he maintains that at the end of Suffolk's meet, he stopped paying the horsemen, and that it, they did not apply for license in October, if you look. They were granted a license when the legislature... Chris, excuse me. I, I, I appreciate it. has been brought up. You'd like to respond, but yeah. it's not... It's. We, there will be a time and a place right. to resolve that, not just. Right. Right. And we understand your point about not everybody agrees all the time with your father. Um, do, do I take from that, Mr. Carney, that um, something in the neighborhood of fifty thousand dollars a a live racing day might be generated um, from simulcast? which could be put to helping to cover these expenses. No, that's, a, it's not, that's not the case. I'm sorry, Chris, is, Chris wasn't in the meetings uh, with the accountants. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it, it, he, Chris may be uh, guessing or estimating what the gross simulcast wagering handle might be, but that is not the net that goes to the, to the track. It, it's, yeah. Well, I'm looking for what I'm looking for a, a, a rough estimate. Would half of the 50 go to the track? No, 10 percent. No, no, it's 10 right. of the f 10 of the 50. Well, I forget what the state breakdown is. So 5 percent of the 50. Probably right around there. Okay. So. It wasn't a huge number. That's why we didn't incorporate sound. Right. It's. So, so that would that would be fifty. That'd be five million seven hundred fifty million five. Seven no, seven hundred and fifty thousand. Seven hundred fifty thousand, right? Yeah. And if you have fifty, percent of that would be seventy-five thousand. Seventy-five thousand. Yeah, right. Just a dent. So even even with simulcasting, it's not going to change the configuration very much. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, can I, can I can I make a budget. procedural point? Sure. All right. That um, you know we're here. Um, two meetings after which this, you know, item was originally on the agenda. It was on the agenda of our of our um, July uh, 21st meeting, and at that time, um, the request for uh, 1.478, etc., uh, two million, uh, was <coughs> submitted by. Uh, the Middleborough uh, Agricultural Society. Um, that's now been been um, uh, um, uh, ch changed in or incorporated uh, into a request um, uh, by the uh, Horsemen's, uh, by the Massachusetts Horsemen's Association. But the essential proposal is the uh, is the uh, is the same. Would it not be appropriate at this point to at least vote on that? Uh, on that proposal, and then if it's if it's accepted, then um, that's the end of the discussion. If it's turned down, um, if we vote it down, then th that could be followed by by um, um, you know, thoughts uh, with regard to um, uh, parsing out the proposal um, as as you have done and as com com Commissioner Cameron has uh, suggested. So, can we do an up or down vote on the proposal? That's what I suggest. We could do that. Is there any, any reason why we necessarily, why, why is that step better than just going straight to parceling out? What, 
Does that add something to the, if we just. I think it kind of clarified. It, 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 well, you're, you're welcome to make a motion. If, if, well, I'm not going to do it if there's not a, a sense of that it's being appropriate. That, well, I think how we've handled these matters in the past is exactly how we're doing it now, which is to uh, delineate which expenses we feel um, could qualify or we think it's a wise use of the public's money and which do not. So uh, I'm just, if we say no, then we're yeah. taking a second vote and, and giving a partial approval. So I'm just not. I, but I'm I think he's, I, a, a vote would, 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 cat, would, would uh, formalize what we have all, I think, clearly already said. There's nobody here arguing in favor of authorizing 1.473 million. Um, so he's he's talking about formalizing that. There are a number of us talking about authorizing something. So uh, I, I don't know what it adds really to make it formal, but I think that's all that's happening. It's not it's not changing. Um, I mean, if that if okay, well, then I'll I'll make a motion. I I, I move that the uh, commission. Uh, uh, um, you know, reject um, the uh, proposal uh, for an expenditure of, of 1.73947. 1.47. 1.47. 1.47. Thousand and one cent, uh, uh, as um, advanced by the uh, Massachusetts Horsemen's Association and originally proposed by the Middleborough Agricultural Society uh, for consideration at our meeting on on. Uh, on uh, July 21st. Second? Yeah, I second that. That's a rejection, right? That's to deny the request yep. for the full amount. Yes. I second that. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. All right. So we will not authorize 1.47. Uh, there has been some interest in authorizing some. Um, is there a is there a middle ground? Any kind? You know, what I suggested was uh, basically what uh, a million three, essentially, right? No, a million two five. Somebody will do the arithmetic. Um, one. I, sorry. Yeah, I, I actually think we have consensus with three commissioners on uh, adding the four hundred thousand as the only expense from the enumerated list to be added to the original request. From the Horsemen's Association, which is um, which is uh, 262, and we've already authorized the 2.4 in purses. So I I yeah, believe I'm, we have a consensus of three to right. move forward with that. <coughs> yeah. Well, I'm just piece. I'm just asking whether there's any appetite for um, finding some middle ground between what I was proposing and the four. Um, well, you know, on, on that, if, if we're taking individual items from here, um, and let's take the 400,000, these individual items were proposed as part of, of an intention to have racing at Brockton this year. Um, and that uh, it's now August, what is today, August 10th. Um, is there any prospect, whether it's 400,000 or 600,000, for there to be any, is there any prospect for there to be live racing at at uh, Brockton this year, uh, if we have not approved uh, the uh, request for uh, the, the we'll call it 1.5 million dollars? So that that was kind of my question earlier uh, that I would put on you know the applicant. Um, yeah. They would have to go back and look and decide if they could do this or not. I think we're somewhere around uh, less than nine hundred thousand dollars difference in the in the two requests. So I think they'd have to factor in simulcast and decide whether or not they could do this. Well, how many people they expect to attract and you know and get in terms of additional handle and yeah, and we would have outs. to make that business decision. Yep. Do, do you want to speak to this, Mr. Yeah, the, 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 the question is that, you know, I, I understand that we're, we're taking and line iteming these items. The thing is that it's really the Hussmen that need this. Um, we need the Connie's facility. That's all we have. Uh, I know that they were not, uh, it wasn't that financially uh, advantageous back in 2001. Um, you know, our, our budget includes the stabling and training. And it also includes the racing budget. And I, I, I only look at the money for the racing budget in, in that, you know, 
we want to run a first class operation. And it's a fair meet, but it's racing for a lot of people. So I don't care if it's a fair meet, if it's a festival meet, or if it's the best racing in the world. It's racing for these horses and for these people. Um, a lot of that administrative money is paid out to employees who are displaced. Uh, the paycheck impact will be great. I certainly think that uh, some of that um, falls into um, the legislative intent of this money. It's to advance thoroughbred racing. We're in an awkward position, and, and, and to Commissioner McDonald's, it is late, and Commissioner Cameron knows it's late. We've looked at what we have right now, and the schedule we have right now, we're up against the wall, because under the agricultural license, the limitations are we can't run beyond October 15th. So right now, if we got approved today, Chris has got to go over there, and they've got to work, you know, and get that place in order, and it's got to be safe. If it's not safe, we don't want to run there. I wouldn't run there. I've had talks with the Jockeys Guild in California and, and the Jockeys Guild in Kentucky. Of course, we want it to be the safest venue possible. But the administrative money, which is a big number, um, is a big part of this. And I think that falls under that category. We, we need to employ these folks. I know that the in, in, incorporating the uh, simulcasting is important, I think, from the business plan. I don't know how much it will generate, but we'd be willing to take off of our budget anything that's certainly anything that's generated would be backed off of what we're asking for. So at $400,000, I, I don't feel as though it can go forward, uh, and it wouldn't go forward, and it's a shame. Um, I do think the intent of that money is to get racing back. I know it's a lot of money, but it's a lot of farms and it's a lot of jobs. I have a passion for what I'm doing. I believe in what I'm doing. There are other groups. I'm not arguing with other groups. I just want to get racing back. And we all know it's a legislative mess, and that's what I've been doing. And I'd like to keep doing it because I know the commission needs more power in doing it. But we do need more than the 400000 to go forward. The counties will find it very difficult to, to move forward with this. And with that, the Hussmen are going to be left, you know, in the same shape we're in when we started. We do need that facility. So it's our need that's brought us here more than their need. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to bring across, that uh, we really need this money to get this done. And... Um, I wish you'd look at it with a little bit of a broader scope and say that, hey, there are other things we can pay for because this money is going to return to the Commonwealth. It's an investment. It's $3.9 million. But that's the beginning of an economic impact of $3.9 million in the local economy and in Massachusetts. The problem is now that when you have racing, and I don't want to get into semantics of how it worked at, in, the, in the weekend at Suffolk, et cetera, et cetera. Local people made money. That's true. But the local people also took the money and spent it out of town because they're not here. They go back to where they're based. And this is for the first, really for the first time in thoroughbred racing, is going to take that race house development fund and say, okay, we're spending $3.97 million, but it's immediately going to have a $3.97 million impact on the Massachusetts economy. And that is going to grow, you know, as people spend. Because without the backside running and training and stabling, you don't have, and I put this in my piece, and I don't want to uh, belabor it because you've, you've read it, you don't have the economic engine that's required to bring thoroughbred racing to the forefront. You need those pieces. And we're in desperate need of this commission looking at that and saying, listen, this, this can work, maybe this can't work, or, you know, it, but it is for the advantage of the husband, and it will contribute to the economy. Um, the, the money will be spent in Brockton and Massachusetts, the feed vendors, et cetera, et cetera, the blacksmiths. It'll be a, a, a cascade, of, cascade effect that will um, really impact the area greatly. And the, and the state will see a return on its investment. I, I think we have to look at this somewhat as an investment in Massachusetts and in Massachusetts racing. And a, a little bit of a jump start to Chairman Crosby's position. It's not the greatest plan in the world, but it's something. The money is there. We've lost 30% of the racehorse development fund via the committee, and it's not their fault. There's no plan here. And we revisit that again in October, and without anything going forward, there's a chance we lose it all. Maybe it all goes to the standard breads, because if it doesn't go to the standard breads, someone on Beacon Hill, and there was a senator the other day that said that he thinks that this money should immediately leave the Racehorse Development Fund and go to a number of other things. And that's going to be the sentiment up there. So I think we're spending money that's there. We're not squandering the money, but we're utilizing this money for Brockton, but truly for the Hussman. And it is an investment in Massachusetts. It will come back to them. The money will be spent here, and the paychecks will be cashed here and people will spend their money here. And I, I asked the commission to look a little in, into a little more detail as to what we could use um, in expenses, because it does mean a lot.
to a lot of folks. I think the difference between 2001 and now is the huge infusion of resource development money. So I don't know that those numbers are fair to look at when there was no resource development monies added to the purses at that point. And I think what we're talking about is a very large number. It's not 400,000. It's 3.16. We'd have to do the math to make sure my math is accurate. But so I, I, I hear you and, um, it, you know, I think we're trying to be as fair as we can here. With that, but still have a responsibility for a state fund. Yeah, it's, it's hard to disagree with anything you say, Mr. Lagorio, with, 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 with the exception of we're not addressing the authority that we have for the purposes of the costs that you're being, you, that you're requesting us uh, to do. Um, I do agree that you know it's it's still a lot of a lot of money. Uh, there has it, it has to be commercially feasible as well for the operator. Um, and, and, you know, that's fundamentally what needs to be put back, in my mind, to, to the Carney Group. Um, as I, I, I agree with your, um, with your position, uh, perhaps we can call out these uh, 400,000 um, out of these requests. Uh, that's a much more direct uh, uh, benefit, in my mind, of the horsemen for all the reasons stated here. Um, but I have a hard time. Um, Making the case for any other of the costs that are uh, typically borne by the by the track. If I could just look at these, the the um, if there's been a concern about giving the money to a private entity, and and I get that concern and sort of feeling that doesn't feel right, and I think it's important that you know this we not use monies to invest in the future of the Carney operations for sure, um, which is why, for example, I think the capital expense should be excluded. But if you look at these numbers, this is money that's not going to the Carney. Virtually none of it is going to the Carney. So there's, go, there's like $40,000 of insurance, 8,000 of it comes back to us. There's tens of thousands for ambulance, horse ambulance, city of Brockton, the fire department, the police department get $35,000 in overtime or whatever it is. Um, this money is not going to the Carneys it is going to make it possible to have a meet. Um, and that's what we're supposed to be doing, is promoting meets. It's, it's ill-defined, you know, we're, we're supposed to be trying to figure out ways to somehow or other promote and salvage this industry. There's tons of people that are saying, this is a small step in that direction. Um, we're not lining anybody's pockets, we're just making it feasible. It's in the nature of the 400,000, it does, if, if the 400000 is a good investment, then why is it not a good investment to permit to, to put up the money to do the race days, the live race days? Um, I know it's different. I mean, I, it, I understand, but um, I'm, I really feel like there is a, you know, we, you, there is a logic. If the money is just sitting there. It is there under the law for the benefit of the horsemen. The horsemen are telling us as passionately as they can that this is for their benefit. Um, but you, if, you take, if you take that argument um, further, um, Suffolk Downs could have, could have run a lot more days, let's sure. say, for, uh, you know, had they known that they could, they could use a number of those days and, and, and have the, the ability application to. application said if Suffolk Downs came and asked for that, they'd support it, you know. <laughs> right. And for that matter, the, not that we have that expertise, but the commission could run the meet if we're, you know, if we're funding, you know, um, all of this. Um, there is a role of the operator here that needs to be taken into account, which includes simulcasting traditionally, you know, tied to the live racing, because that is really what what provides the the, the, the tripod here of the of of, of the industry, um, and. Um, uh, again, I, I, I'm worried about the precedent. Um, you know, I know we're thinking, you know, very short term because that's the nature of where the industry stands uh, right now. Um, but uh, that that money runs out very quickly if the further we go down uh, the road of funding private operations. In my mind, uh, Mr. I, I, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I just want to suggest one point. Our our applicant and our licensee here is Middleborough. And they would be bearing the statutory responsibility for running the meet, making sure things are done appropriately. I mean, we, we've heard 
eloquently from the horsemen, but the only person who can commit to making and, and using the funds and doing what you would hope they would do is Middleborough itself. They, they are our licensee and they are the applicant. Right. And that is part of my concern is a constantly changing application, nothing really clearly um, um, identified as real costs, um, a real commitment to running. I haven't seen that commitment. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the passionate race uh, horsemen's association here that really wants this. In fact, they're not in a position to bargain. I, I, I think they look at these costs and they know that these are costs they shouldn't be funding, frankly. Um, but they're in no position to bargain because they have no other alternative. And, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's a tough for me to just carte blanche say, yeah, we'll pay for everything. Um, when there's been nothing articulated, this application has changed over the months uh, tremendously, frankly, without always good explanation. Um, it, it just, to me, does not pass the um, sniff test. invested $3 million. Nobody said to us, hey, look, it was a nice try. Here you go. Here's some money to make up for your losses. So the numbers we are projected right now, we are not projecting numbers to lose at this point. I would love at this point in my day in my life, because of my love and my passion for raising and such my fathers, to say, here's my facility. Use it. Pay your bills. And let's see how it goes. We didn't have one debtor from the 2001 experience. Not one person came came to this commissioner at any one time and said, oh, the county's didn't pay me for the rail because they lost money. They didn't pay me, they didn't pay me for this because they lost money. Every one of the horsemen has got their purses, okay? The reason why we're here today is because of the passion and the love of the racing. Let me put it this way. I'd be happy if Suffolk County ran 150 days, okay? They simulcast, okay, which is simulcasting away from other facilities in Massachusetts, okay, in this today's day and age. So you talk a little bit about rain of maybe suffering for 15 days of the year. It really wouldn't suffer at fifty thousand dollars a day. You know what I'm saying? So I just don't want the commission to get a misguided idea of what the counties mm -hmm. are trying to do. Yeah, I would love you told me, hey, look, it, you can make fifteen percent. You know, I'm in the rubbish business. I'm all about making fifteen percent and going home. I'm totally happy with it. But you know what? I, at my father's age of eighty-eight, my mother had a hernia problem last night. That's my dad in there. He'd be sitting right up there, believe me. He'd be going back and forth with everybody in this commission. Well, it was good, bad, or indifferent. You know what? He's not going to take another gamble at 88 years old. We've already gone over two in the gaming license, as you know that. You know what? I'm not putting my hat out to my dad and saying, hey, look it. Just throw the money up. Don't worry. We'll make it. You know, at this point in time, the numbers we put, don't get me wrong, there's probably a cushion in there. But you know what? No. Let me put it this way. Bill needs to touch on a little bit. The game, excuse me, the legislature at some point in their day is going to say, hey, look it. There is no thoroughbred racing in Massachusetts. You can't count six days of thoroughbred racing in Massachusetts as a great victory as meet in Massachusetts. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't say, hey, look it. And you saw the um, Senate president say last year, I think in the State House News, he talked very vividly about taking the money about away from the Racehorse Development Fund. And when you come to move the plan, whether it's a racetrack or not, they'll reinstate it and refund the money, not as far as go back as far as starting forward. I understood when you when you took the money from the thoroughbreds and went to the standardized. It was a totally great idea. They're up and running, they're live. Six days I don't consider live. If you look at the fifteen days we tried to come in, in many days Catherine Blue will sit there and Dr. Lightbaum will sit there. And it, Mr. Commissioner Stevens, I've been in the commission six, seven times and we've changed the, the application different times. Mr. Marizio has fought with Billy, he's fought with me, he's fought with my dad. You know, Mr. Uh, Attorney Brown, let me put it this way. Everything's been thrown on the table. The reason why we're here today is because we have to get running by Labor Day, Monday, which should be the Friday, Saturday, well, Saturday, Sunday, that Suffolk ran, and we'd start on Monday because of the time set in October the 15th. You know, so I don't know what more I can do or more what I say. If you think simulcast is the end all, I'll put it in we'll simulcast those 15 days. I just don't think that it's got to be like, Oh my God, you just did 150,000 sound cats with your people in. I've been there. I've okay. done it. I sat there. I was a Leo. I was a bus boy. I've been in the racing business my whole life. No other applicant has sat before you today 
or any other day that's ever wanted for mobile racing. We got knocked out because of a, a terrible vote of Massachusetts in itself. We didn't give our license up and say. Okay, we got it. You did that yeah. one. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that was so helpful. We got it. Um, all right, so um, we have um, some opinions. Uh, Commissioner Stevens, do you have a, uh, where are you coming down on, on how much and weather? Can I just take a quick break? Sure, sure. I'm sorry. Let's all take a quick break. We'll come right back. <laughs> Thank you. We are temporarily adjourned. Sorry. All right, we are reconvening public meeting number 197 at about 11.25. Um, Commissioner Stevens, I had asked um, where you were on what you think we might authorize or not authorize. Um, I, think we I think before I'd answer that, you know, uh, it might behoove us to, to have some just general comments or responses under the breakdown of some of these costs. Um, I, I worry a jockey insurance is way too low. I don't know what other general and administrative expenses are. Uh, I don't know what legal fees are during a 15-day meet. Um, I don't know if we could have our applicant just kind of walk down through some of these costs and how they arrived at them. Who was who was the uh, responsible would, party? Would you like to do that? Sure. sure. If you would. Um, I know because I was in, if not all of the meetings, most of the meetings. We sat with uh, Bill Ligorio, uh, and we started to outline what would it cost to operate the 15-day meet and 112 days of stabling and training. The philosophy that we followed was that we're not trying to make any money, uh, put any money in our pocket, just cover the expenses and identify what they are. Uh, in some cases, we had some historical data, uh, but most cases we had to rely upon others to, to uh, give us the information. So for example, uh, the jockey insurances, uh, I think that number may have come from Bill, or, uh, but we didn't go to an insurance agent yet and get that priced. We haven't had the time to do that yet. So that number could be very low, uh, may very well be. Uh, we went through the staffing requirements and we determined how much we would be paying people and what's the employer's taxes and the benefits that have to be added to that and we, we ran those numbers higher. Uh, the legal fees are in part to d defend uh, uh, this lawsuit that the NHBBA is, is coming for. Uh, we We'll have to uh, go before the uh, licensing board, perhaps, of the city of Brockton uh, for uh, you know, food and beverage permits and what have you. Um, so uh, we went through that exercise several times uh, to try and generate what we thought the cost to operate would be. And in our mind, we remembered that in 2001, it wasn't three million was four and a half to five million, depending upon what costs, that we actually expended to bring racing back to Brockton in 2001. Now, we know that there were some renovations to the grandstand that we did at that time, and we don't have to do that now, but we went through a significant expense back in 20, 2001, and we realized and we knew that many of those expenses we'd have to incur again, and that they would, of course, be higher having 15 years of time having passed. Um, we know based upon, you know, you look at the subcontractor services, AMTOTE. We use AMTOTE now at the, in Raynham, so we know what their monthly expenses are, and we assume they would be the same. And so we went through that type of bottoms-up exercise. Uh, do we have a high degree in confidence that we've captured everything? No. We think that there'll be expenses we haven't thought of that we'll incur. Uh, you know, but, but we did our very best to come up with what we thought this would be in terms of expense. The horsemen agreed with it, and it would be paid, uh, I, I know the commissions moved beyond this, but it would be paid by the horsemen through the horseman purse account. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, this is what we thought would be necessary to, 
to bring racing back. The only other thing, and I'll close by saying, again, and I think Mr. Carney has said this several times, George Carney, he's not getting into horse racing at the Brockton Fair in order to turn it into a profitable business. That's not his long-term plan. No one knows what will happen. He's doing it now because Bill Ligorio came to him. He, they needed a place to race. They needed to help the horsemen. He loves horse racing. It's something he loves to do. And at 88 years old, it was something that he thought would be a, something pleasurable, something he wanted to do. So he's, we've taken the approach of working with the horsemen, working with staff to come up with a, with a way where we could run this 15-day meet and do the racing and stabling for the four months. Not to the county benefit. This is not something that's to benefit that family at all. It's for these folks. The only benefit will be, will be the enjoyment and satisfaction that George would see if it happens. And uh, Commissioner uh, Stebbins, the notion of what I had suggested, and I think we do this anyway, all these things are paid after the fact. So, mm -hmm. and we would be auditing and making sure that the uh, numbers were um, appropriate for us, whatever it is we spend. Anything else, Commissioner? You, you had said that was the first thing you wanted to ask. No, I, I mean, that, that was the most important question I had at the time. I, I, I feel I'm going to repeat myself, but I, I, I really worry about the precedent piece um, here. Uh, when, whenever we're doing a public procurement, and I've done many before I came here, there's always the notion of who else might have not, might have done something different with the decisions that you make after the solicitation. And this, after all, was a solicitation for a license application. And uh, we're well into the, for a number of reasons, I won't have to rehash any, um, we're well into the, the, the year that this was supposed to be taking place. We're well half past the mid-year. Um, and I, I mentioned this before, but uh, if, if it is not inconceivable to think that Suffolk Downs could have raised more days um, for the benefit of these horsemen, the people right here, and the people that you represent, uh, uh, Mr. Lagorio, if they knew that they could use any one of these monies for administrative stabling, administrative expenses. Um, so there's a question of fairness, first and foremost, and there's a question of um, precedent. And I, I understand, uh, you know, all the, all the efforts from, um, from, from, from all of you uh, uh, to, to try to uh, give a, a lifeline uh, to people who are not able to take uh, uh, their horses out of, out of state or for, for whatever reason. Um, but it's important for us when we make these kinds of decisions to consider the what if and, and what next. Um, and, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's with that in mind that I put all of these categories, as Commissioner Cameron does, of track operating expenditures in a very distinct category um, from administrative expenses to the association uh, like, like we've already uh, approved for, for both associations. Mm -hmm. um, could I, could I ask a question of uh, Dr. Leipam? Um, in your considerable experience, we getting back to the issue of safety, which of course we would never, uh, as we've talked about, and for every track, they need a safety inspection that passes before they can operate. Uh, and we've explained this months and months ago to, to all of the tracks. But in your estimation, um, to train a horse, a thoroughbred horse that has not been training, What's your experience with how much time they need to be fit for racing? Six weeks to two months. So that speaks to the safety issue as well, correct? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm afraid that I've come across as the, uh, as the person who is not <coughs> sympathetic uh, to, the, to the horsemen and to the interest of, of, um, of the carnies. And I just want to underscore that uh, um, I could not be more uh, sympathetic uh, to uh, to the uh, long-term interest of the of the horsemen and the um, the prospect of a, um, a vibrant um, you know equestrian uh, horse racing industry in uh, in, Massa in in Massachusetts and I and I credit uh, 
Mr. Carney's statement, you know, here, as to, and Mr. Maurizio's, um, you know, statement that uh, the Carneys aren't in this um, uh, for money, but rather for the for the benefit and the interest of the horse racing industry. The problem that I have, just so that my position is clear, is that I interpret um, uh, the statute, of the horse race development fund statute, as as not authorizing um, this. Uh, uh, what has been uh, proposed here? I think that we would be, we would be um, uh, vulnerable to to a legal action if we uh, uh, approve this. And uh, essentially, my 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 judgment is that what's before us, or was before us, is a flawed proposal, and that uh, I'm not averse to to approving, um, uh, you know, individual items, but uh, I'd be very reluctant to approve them without it being. Um, um, you know, packaged uh, into a proposal that thoughtfully addresses uh, the legal um, restrictions, limitations, and putting it positively, the authorizations um, uh, uh, as it pertains to um, our uh, being requested of approving these uh, these line items. So um, uh, that's my. <coughs> Uh, you know, fellow commissioners, that's my that's my view here, and I, I uh, am also um, uh, um, mindful of what uh, Commissioner uh, Zuniga has uh, has stated with regard to his concern for for precedent and asking the uh, the what if and uh, what might happen uh, questions if we were to uh, proceed on this um, uh, on this basis uh, today, and I would just to say again, I'm I'm reluctant to approve. Any item from uh, this um, uh, proposal, without it being packaged um, uh, into a coherent proposal that addresses the legal um, uh, principal concerns that um, uh, that I have. If I might just speak to that, um, Mr. McDonald, um, a literal interpretation of the Racehorse Development Fund statute uh, says "shall," um, and I think taking a uh, restrictive view, uh, without considering the full uh, the full board's power that is granted to them to interpret and expand, if necessary, what the Racehorse Development Fund says in order to effectuate the purpose. So, taking a restrictive view, and I certainly can see, you know, looking at the racehorse development statute, that you could do a literal reading. You could take a little reading, but when we encompass the board's regulatory discretion associated with the statutory mandate, I think that you can reach a discretionary decision without going back to the legal justification of the Racehorse Development Fund. And I think that we've moved beyond that uh, to the regulatory authority and the discretion that sits with the commission to fashion some sort of remedy that meets the legislative mandate to get funds into the horseman's hands. And certainly if we walk backwards, and, and Ms. Cameron has a, a, a proposal, she has a number in her head that she thinks is, is uh, workable here. Uh, I'm sure uh, the, uh, some other commissioners may be. But I want to go back to the precedent. The precedent is that Suffolk spending $95,000 a day to run a race. That's the precedent. These numbers aren't anywhere near that number. If you look at $950,000 to run 10 days of racing, they're I'm sorry, six days of racing, four days of, of, of training. Um, $95,000 a day, that's the comparison. We, and I think we have that in our submittal. If we look back at the submittal, we're running for peanuts compared to what Suffolk's running for. They're not coming back in because they need $95,000 a day to run. And I don't think this commission's going to grant them $95,000 a day to run. Thus, the legislation to use the money contractually and statutorily, the takeout money. That's going to be used for their expenses. We don't have that luxury, although we're willing to simulcast to do that. I think the mandate from the legislature is to get the money into the horseman's hands. Not at $95,000 a day, we're not asking that. What we're asking is something considerably less, and it's almost the national average 
to run any track in the country. But Mr. Sporano, you, you mentioned the mandate of the legislation yeah. to give the money to the horseman's hands. They're just turning around and giving it to the track. But that's a legitimate expense. It's a legitimate expense in order to, uh, to operate and for the horsemen to function. Their main function is to run meets. Their main function is to race. Without the ability to either lease or have the county step forward and, and, and offer, this, uh, offer this track, um, we can't even get to the point where you can grant the money because racing isn't being allowed to move forward. But looking back at the, the disparity in the numbers and the ability for, for um, uh, Suffolk to race, it, it's costing $95,000 a day, and that's shown in the legal portion of the memo. We're considerably less than that. And just going back to the national average, what it costs to run Oklahoma or over at Saratoga, we have discussed it with every track. We've looked at their, we've looked at their uh, average dailies to run both the front and back side. We are significantly below that. But Mr. Scarano, the difference is this is taxpayer money. We did our homework too. We reached out to RCI. There is no precedent for using a fund like this to fund all track operations. There is a precedent for using uh, monies for uh, rental of stalls. So we, we like you, have really um, agonized over this. But we have a responsibility to use taxpayer money wisely. It's, it's not just give it all to the horsemen. That can't be how we make a decision, frankly. Fully understand. And I'm just going to yield to Mr. Uh, Ligorio so he can follow up on that. Oh, just a uh, Commissioner Zuniga, who I respect greatly, um, handing the money over to um, Brockton, as, it, as Chairman Crosby said, it's, it's jobs. This is about jobs. Is it sensible to create jobs in the Commonwealth? Is it sensible to put people back to work? Is it the proper use of racehorse development fund money, uh, t tax taxpayer monies, to put people back to work and to allow this money to go back into the local economy via their, the way they spend, the way they buy? It's, it's quite possible that Brockton's uh, dr training days will create about 60 to 90 full-time jobs on the backside from, from trainers and hustlers back there. And then the jobs, uh, the, the firemen and so on and so forth, just the beginning. The racing office is going to employ people that have been out of work for quite a while. It's all about jobs. We keep going back to we're going to hand, hand it over to Brockton. We're going to hand it over to paychecks. It's about money. It's about jobs. This state is about jobs. That money is about jobs. We're creating jobs. We're saving an industry. We're saving farms. You, you, you look at this and you'd say, we're handing it over to the counties. I'm not handing anything over to the counties. I, I wouldn't represent the husband I represent in doing that but I am handing this money over for good jobs. And those people are going to get paid. And it's going to, the, the paycheck impact is going to be more than significant. And, you know, without an in-plan study as far as what we've done, because the sampling is so small, I will tell you that we can easily say that the $4 million will turn into $5 million with some limited spending in Brockton. And that we can easily look at something about two times that number in the overall economic impact. So. Are there precedents throughout the state? I can go back to Maryland back in 2011 when they did use gaming money, and it's a different state, so don't get me wrong, I know that. They did use gaming money to help fund 146 days of racing in Maryland because of a situ situation they ran into. It's been done before in this country, and in this state, this is new to us. The, the, the Resource Development Fund is new, and Commissioner Cameron is right, there's a lot of money. But we're paying out this money for jobs. It's jobs creation that we all live and die by, and I really think we'll have We'll have, we'll have that. We'll, have, we'll, we'll get a return, and the commission will get a return on their investment in this money coming out of 23K. I really believe they will. And, you know, it, it, it's a passion, but it's beyond that. It's getting people back to work. But I do, I do think it's going for its intended purpose. It's not going to the counties. All right, there is a proposal on the table um, for an uh, informal proposal for uh, to authorize the 400,000. Um, I would like to authorize more. Is there any other commissioner who is interested in the possibility of authorizing more? Okay, then I think we should have a motion on the 400. I don't know that there's any more to, uh, to talk about. Is there further discussion? 
Well, I, I don't know. When we say 400,000, it's, it's a much larger number than that. Have, have we authorized yeah. the 262 yet? Um, um, I don't believe that you voted at the last meeting about the purse money or correct. the money to the, to the Horsemen's right. Association. So you would want to we'll include those it, as right. well. well. We'll structure it properly. You going to say something? Yeah, I, you know, I just want to uh, appreciate Bill's comments. And uh, at the same time, I appreciate the comments from my, my colleague Commissioner Zuniga in terms of precedent. Um, it, it, you know, I, you know, I kind of wrestle now with the question of uh, if the horsemen were, the Horsemen's Association uh, asked us for uh, an amount of money for their association's operations that included the 400000 for the training installing, um, and an additional amount of money for their purposes of helping to conduct racing. Um, I think to Commissioner Zuniga's point, you know, uh, in terms of precedent, you know, we had the other Horsemen's Association come in here talk to us, put a proposal on the table for a certain amount of money and a certain amount of money for a study that uh, at the time we didn't feel was appropriate use of the money. Um, I, I'm wrestling with how I would look at us sitting here a year from now, hopefully not sitting here a year from now trying to wrestle with this same problem. Um, but if the other horsemen's association came to us and said, we want this amount of money for administrative costs. We want this amount of money to help us uh, pay the costs associated with con you know, conducting a meet. Um, does it solve the precedent? You know, the precedent we don't want to go down the road of falling into a, the other tracks requesting money from us or, or or what the issue? I, that's the question I, I guess I'm wrestling with right now. Well, they did. They did back then, and, and the, the NEHBPA did. Uh, we approved 225,000 yes. for their operations. We did. The MTHA is doing that now. Yes. We are about to approve the 250. 262. 262. Plus 400. Um, plus the 400. Plus the 400. Um, which is different. Right. Fee directly related to the horsemen. Right. Correct. And I, I guess my point is, and Commissioner, I'd, you know, welcome your thoughts on uh, finding a solution this way uh, of allocating more money to the Horsemen's Association for the purposes of putting on a meet. Well, that's what they're suggesting. Right. That's what they're saying. And they need, you know, and they want $1.4 million, $1 million. Right. As opposed to having that money go to purses. To fund to the horsemen well, they to go still back have to the upper. They, it's, it right. still has to in go through the purses. Person. Well, and, and it has to, as Catherine said, it has to go by there. Our licensee is MAS, middle, so it would have to be, go through them. I've thought too, you know, could it be structured in a different way so that this extra money is part of the administrative and horse racing operation expenses of the association, right. um, so that we're focusing on, uh, you know, simply giving more money to the association who will use it for horse racing operations, which is one of the words there. Right. Um, I, I think that's a, a, it might have been a little different if they'd come in that way in the first place, but I think we're beyond that at this point. As far as precedent, you know, we've talked about this in a number of our dealings. Um, there for sure are issues of equity involved. You know, we have to try to figure out how to treat different parties equally. Um, but we are also treating, we're here as we are on other areas, we are breaking new ground. We, we are clear to say we are not setting precedents which we expect to be bound by. We're bound by equity and process, and due process and fairness, but we're not bound by these precedents. Each situation is very individually fact-based. Um, if somebody else looked at this and came back in and said, okay, rather than X days of racing, I'll do four times X days of racing, if you were to put up some money, we looked at those facts, we would have the ability to think about it or not. If we decided based on that fact pattern, you know, we would, we could say yes or no. We would not be compelled to do any specific thing as a consequence of, of this decision. It sounds like you're wrestling with the possibility of authorizing more. Do, do you want to 
than than the than the four. I, and uh, I, I, I talk about this without without actually a, another figure in mind beyond the four hundred thousand dollars that we've already discussed, and I'm certainly in favor. I don't know whatever what that additional request would be, or what that additional amount would be. Well, the only the only proposal that we've had is that it be capped at whatever whatever the arithmetic was at ICAMS that you know a million two or something like that, and that it be very carefully audited by our staff to make sure that it goes for the expenses um, that we uh, had set out here. And I think between uh, Alex and Doug, we, we could certainly do that. Uh, that's the only other poss That's the only other thing that's been discussed at this point. Um, so if, if if you have some other idea, um, go for it. But if if not, then I think we can move on. We're yep. ready for a motion. Sounds like I just want to make sure that Commissioner Stebbins has finished his thought process. Sounds Never like finished. Yeah. Yeah. All right, then I think. We're okay, ready. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the original request for purse monies, which is. 2.4, I believe. 2. You can 5. check those numbers. The latest, it was 2.4, and now it's 2.5, and I don't know what that difference is. The original was 2.5. Okay, so yeah. 2.5 uh, plus the original request for the Horsemen's Association, which is 2.62, yes. in addition to 400,000 from the uh, enumerated list, which is directly related to the horsemen, that is training, installing, rent for 16 weeks. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it unanimously. I think that's where we are with item 3A. Thank you, folks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, how's our transcriber doing? <laughs> You ready to switch to 3B? Yep. Mm -hmm. No, we should. Yeah. Can you stop, Mr. Salim? Yeah. Mr. If, Salim, right? Yeah. Uh, if he's going to address the commission, then it needs to be on yeah. the it needs record. To be on the record. So yes. Yes. Yeah. that's okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Thank you. All right. So we're up, we're on item 3B, um, the Brockton Fairgrounds. No, item 3B is being skipped. Correct? No, item 3B is irrelevant at this point and being skipped. Okay. So we're on item 3C. Suffolk Downs request for approval of racing officials, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Director Lightbound. So uh, Suffolk Downs has asked for um, the addition of one key operating personnel and three racing officials. Uh, these uh, folks actually worked last weekend and with the delegation that the uh, commission had given to the director of racing several years ago for time sensitive issues like this, um, I went ahead and approved them, but they do need your official vote. So um, that's what we're asking for is um, the commission approve the request to approve their July 28th and August 5th list of key operating personnel and racing officials um, pending completion of their background checks by the state police. Alex, are these these folks going to be used for the remaining weekend? Uh, I th one or two of them might be. Some of them were just used for this past weekend, okay. and the regular people doing the jobs will be back. They had different commitments and things. Okay. Yep. This is in keeping with what we've done in the past in emergency situations for employees and um, I agree with uh, Dr. Lightbaum's recommendation and uh, and uh, recommend that we approve this request. You want to so move? Yeah, uh, so move that we requ uh, that we um, the additional key operating personnel and racing officials uh, laid out in our memo we approve their um, uh, status. Their status. Good word. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Yeah. And now um, Senior Financial Analyst Doug O'Donnell will uh, discuss Suffolk Downs' request for approval of Naira Betts 
as an advanced deposit wagering um, vendor. Good morning, Commission. Good morning. What you, what you have in front of you is a memo um, regarding Suffolk Downs' request for Naira Bets, which is an AUW um, provider. Mm -hmm. Suffolk Downs Chief Operating Official Chip Tuttle, who is here with us today, has submitted a request for approval to contract with Naira Bets. Mm -hmm. um, he sent a letter to Director Lightbound on August 5th requesting this approval, and it was followed up by a contract with Naira Bets on August 8th. And Naira Bets is a legal U.S. based, regulated, and licensed provider of horse racing wagering. Uh, they're based out of uh, the state of New York, and this year they have ex expanded in over 20 different states throughout the country. They operate in the same manner as the other ADWs that Suffolk Downs is currently contracted with, which is um, TVG, Twin Spires, and Express Bets. Mm -hmm. And we are recommending today that the Commission approve the request of Suffolk Downs to enter into this contract with Naira Bets. Mm. Mr. Tuttle, what additional benefit does this company bring you? <coughs> Uh, all of our uh, relationships with uh, ADW providers uh, uh, provide a revenue share for, mm -hmm. for the operator, <coughs> revenue share for, for purses, and uh, fees, uh, the mandatory fees to the Commonwealth. Um, given the proximity, Massachusetts to New York, and the popularity of uh, Saratoga and Belmont Park and things like that, uh, we believe that Naira Bets will be successful with uh, Massachusetts uh, consumers and that it's in our interest to partner with them uh, on the endeavor. Mm -hmm. So is this an incremental? I'm just curious. Um, to what you have otherwise, or is this, are you replacing other ADW? It, it's incremental. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <coughs> is there anything controversial about this? Any, are there any, any reason to think not to approve it? No, they're just looking to, yeah. to get additional market share. And right. again, they operate the same way as the current uh, ADWs mm -hmm. that we work with. So their reports will come in the same way. They pay the same fees to the Commonwealth. And typically, do we license uh, these kind of operations, like in the gaming side? Would this be a... No, on the no? racing side, we don't go through... We don't go through any of that. Check. Um, and actually, the ADWs are traditionally um, approved during the license application in the fall. So um, there are other three were part of their application then and, and were approved as part of the application and this is a new group so, okay. so sort of that's why it needs to come in front of you now <coughs> yeah precedent has been there they're licensed as as agents for us mm -hmm. so this would be in place you're hoping for the last weekend of racing um <coughs> it'd be in place as soon as you authorize it yeah. it'd be in place as soon as today so yeah. simulcast yeah. right but I mean, you know, they're looking yeah. at starting this August 8th, obviously, it'll be in place for yeah. your last. Oh, course. yeah, absolutely. For my benefit, and I'm new, I'm, I'm new here, as everybody knows, what, what is um, advanced deposit wagering? <coughs> advanced deposit wagering is um, a system whereby uh, you open an account and fund money in that account, and then you take advantage of horse racing status uh, as legal online wagering in the United States per the Interstate Horse Racing Act. It's been conducted. And when you say you, you mean a, a better? <coughs> you, a better, yes. So um, you may be precluded due to your position, uh, Judge McDonald, but <laughs> uh, others. We are uh, precluded. We have yes, to remind them. Uh, others um, can open He's an account, fund that account, and uh, through their, their laptop or their phone, uh, execute wagers on a variety of races that we simulcast. So they actually make it, a, in effect, a cash deposit, mm -hmm. and you're betting against that deposit. <clears throat> Correct. Yeah, in, in Massachusetts, um, and they do that throughout the country, but in Massachusetts specifically, there are uh, pretty strict terms about extending credit to uh, wagering accounts. And one of the benefits of, there are some <clears throat> wagering account operators that operate in sort of a gray area and don't, you know, seek to partner with licensees. Uh, one of the benefits of us having these relationships is that we ensure that they all, um, as part of their contract, have to abide by Massachusetts regulations. Right. Mr. Chair, I would move the commission approve Sterling Suffolk Racecourses LLC's request uh, to use, utilize Naira Bets uh, as a provider of advanced deposit wagering services on behalf of Suffolk Towns. Second. 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 Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. 
Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Tuttle, another Thank successful you. weekend last weekend. We got the reports. Uh, yes, we, we did have a successful weekend. Thank you very much. Um, the interest remains strong. Mm -hmm. um, we had two days of very competitive racing, and, and we are preparing a purse report for the commission as we did uh, last year. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's it That's for it. you? Yes. All right. Um, the fourth item is an administrative update for our executive director who is not mm -hmm. with us today. The fifth is commissioner's updates. Is there anything any of us I, has? I, I would just like to take a minute to thank Dr. Lightbaum and to thank General Counsel Blue. An awful lot of work went into um, agonizing work, frankly, to prepare recommendations for us, repeated meetings to try to assist applicants with getting something before us. So I just want to acknowledge the work that was done. I think um, they went above and beyond in their job responsibilities. And it's very difficult to, with such a passionate group, to, to make those kinds of recommendations. And i just just familiar with the work and, and, want, and want to say thank you. I, I would echo that, you know, at the, at the same time, you know, I don't know how we have this conversation, but I don't want to find us back here a year from now trying to debate these same issues around the future of thoroughbred race, or else you know the stories we've seen in the media are going to continue to pile up. Uh, and yet, you know, as we sit here, we know the Racehorse Development Fund is having some positive impacts on, on the standard bred race. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got to have the parties figure it out and try to come up with a plan that's more than just a band-aid that we can support. I agree with that, and, and to that end, I, I wonder, um, maybe this is really too ambitious, but, you know, the, the racing applications are due by October? October 1st. And we're supposed to be deciding those by December. November 15th. Oh, November 15th. Yeah. And the recent history has been very challenging for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, but now we're going to have a little bit of, we, at least assumptions as to what may or may not happen in the following year. Now we have uh, another legislation that's going to expire in the middle of the calendar year, um, which is just, it's just what it is. But if we could somehow try to get the parties, uh, try to capitalize on all the work that you do, in fact, uh, leading up to, you know, to these commission meetings, um, with, an, uh, with a better understanding of all these dynamics, to try to keep us as close as possible to the statutory deadlines uh, relative to approving applications or not. I, I, I think ultimately it would be a lot more beneficial for everybody if we, if, if, if we had a, 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 a feel that everybody understood that they had to you know, abide by. Um, Again, for, for a number of very worthy reasons, uh, we, we, we've approved uh, these placeholder applications, but that ultimately results in a day like today, yep. where with a number of um, variations, iterations, understanding by one group, misunderstanding by another perhaps, um, and I think to the extent that we could try to keep to what is clearly a, a um, a time frame established for the purposes, um, it would be that much uh, beneficial. So I only, I only ask that um, we give it a, a strong try. I know we've done it in the past, and for a number of reasons, you know, we've had to approve those placeholder applications. But as one commissioner, I'm going to be a lot more reluctant of approving those uh, placeholders if we clearly see that there's not a baked uh, you know, so, solution, understanding of what they what they propose to do. When when that um, application came in, um, <laughs> we first met with uh, Brockton in the spring. We were just looking for there were certain numbers in the application that they hadn't filled out, and that's simply what we were looking for at that time. Was things like you know your insurance, um, who your um, uh, refreshment vendors are going to be. Um, we had a question on the security because we weren't quite sure on who was in charge of that. So it started out a very simple, you know, fill in the blanks that we understand you couldn't fill in in November, and now you can fill in. And then it, it morphed into a com almost a completely new application. 
You know, Director Lightbong is correct. We were looking for a limited scope of information, and we got a lot more different information as time went on. Right. The, the real issue, as we've all discussed, is that somebody, us if the legislature wants to give it to us, but somebody needs to have the authority to pull all the parties together and come up with a, a, a real strategic plan that everybody can get behind and that we feel comfortable util, utilizing the, the, the assets, the simulcast licenses and the resource development fund, which are the two real assets here, uh, to, to get behind. And, uh, you know, hopefully somebody will somebody at the legislature will decide that that's a priority and give somebody that authority, which would make everybody's lives a lot easier. Okay. Any other? Go well, ahead. I just want to join in <coughs> what Commissioner Cameron said in expressing my gratitude to uh, Catherine and, uh, and, and to Alex. I think uh, uh, we took up two of our, <laughs> two of our weekly meetings that I have with, with uh, General Counsel uh, Blue on these uh, issues, and then I swept uh, uh, Alex uh, uh, into uh, into the discussion uh, as well, and um, I'm very very grateful uh, for for their help and in um, uh, my being able to uh, think through the uh, uh, issues. Um, regardless that my bottom line may not have been what everybody else's bottom line uh, you know on it uh, uh, on it was, but uh, very grateful to you both. Anything else, Commissioner? Updates. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Second. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Cameron, I mean uh, McDonald. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you all.